Funding for Behind the Headlines is provided by DHG and Advisors. DHG is a full-service accounting firm serving Memphis and the Mid-South region for more than 60 years, combining community involvement with the technical resources of a national firm. For more information, visit dhgllp.com. Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. The ongoing effort to fight blight in Memphis, tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by a number of folks. We'll start with Steve Lockwood, head of the Fraser Community Development Corporation. Thanks for being here. Also, Patrice Thomas from the Department of Neighborhood Improvement for the City. Thank you for being here. Steve Barlow, uh, an attorney who does a lot of work for the city on these sorts of issues. Thanks for being here. Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. And Mark Herbison from the Memphis Chamber. Thank you all. So let's start with what, you know, we talk about blight and maybe even just a definition. And I'm going to go to Patrice first. From your point of view, from the city's point of view, uh, it's almost a silly question, but it's not. What is blight and why is it a, a need to be a priority? Well, I define, first of all, the mission of neighborhood improvement is to create noticeable and sustainable improvement in every city of Memphis neighborhood through education, engagement, and enforcement of the city property codes. So from that standpoint, I view the definition of blight as anything that is a violation of our city property codes, and anything that makes the city look unsightly. Yeah, and from you on the ground in Fraser, Steve, uh, blight in Fraser takes the form of what? You know, blight's everything from, from tall weeds and bags blowing down the block through large degraded buildings. Uh, you know, what we've concentrated on are the buildings that, that bring real damage to our tax base and damage to the, to the neighborhoods, both psychological and, and financial. Uh, so it, it, it's buildings, it's, and it's, it's a lot, what we've allowed to happen to many of our buildings in, in many of our neighborhoods. Is it also, in some sense, the, the, the things that come as a result of that? It's Absolutely. not just an aesthetic. It's not just hard to look at. There's Absolutely. behaviors that, that are in some ways tied to blight that uh, come before and after. There are behaviors. There are policies. You yeah. know, there, there are systemic issues that have allowed this all the way from from tax foreclosure policies up through uh, policies of plastic right. bags. Yeah, yeah, and we'll, we'll get more into that. But let me get everybody in real quick. From the, the chamber's point of view, uh, it's been a, a, what the chamber's called a moon mission, a, you know, a clean by 2019 effort. What's the chamber's perspective on this and why did they identify this as such a high priority? Well, we see the condition as far as trash and blight in the city as an economic development issue. We have to bring corporate executives, consultants into town all the time to consider Memphis as a place to put an operation and to, and to create new jobs. And with the trash and the blight situation, it, it, it really has caused some consultants to not want to consider Memphis. And so we think that it's a, a real serious economic development issue and that cleaning the city up and, and tackling the blight issue will help us to create new jobs going forward. And we'll segue with you, Steve Barlow. You, you've done a lot, you've, you've worked a lot of cases on behalf of the city um, about specific buildings, specific properties. Right. What, so if, if that's the, the quick view of the problem, we'll dig into a lot of what people said, but what can you do, what are the legal avenues available to you as a lawyer um, to take care of, get rid of, and, or improve blighted buildings? Well, to me, uh, I see blighted properties through the lens of uh, legal violation. And I see the main solution uh, as being a legal solution. So uh, the, across the country, uh, the cities that are doing the best at addressing blighted properties are cities that have a very aggressive, uh, coordinated legal strategy because the, what, what, we're, what we're really talking about is what are the root causes of blighted properties? There's abandonment. Uh, there is uh, irresponsibility of property owners. 
there are confusing airship issues, um, bankruptcy issues, uh, other legal issues uh, pertaining to families or pertaining to uh, 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 the uh, long-term uh, responsibilities of, of people and families. So uh, to me, it's a, it's a legal issue. And what we do is uh, address the legal issue by first giving people an opportunity to cure what we call a violation. And then uh, if they don't do that voluntarily, we take them to court. And we've done that. The city of Memphis has developed a uh, very aggressive legal strategy. There is a team uh, in the city attorney's office that uh, takes referrals from other divisions of local government and from the private sector and will bring cases against owners, get them in court within 30 days of filing an action and uh, ask the environmental court judge to order the owner to either tear it down fix it up to habitable, usable for its intended purpose standards, or to transfer it out. Yeah, and but do you, you talk about the cities uh, around the country that handle this best. Um, do, you, do you feel like Memphis is one of those cities? Do you feel like it's getting there or does it have a long ways to go? We have one of the most creative, most aggressive legal strategies. Our challenge right now is just one of scale. Uh, we need to scale up our efforts. Uh, the challenge in our community is huge. We have many thousands of single family homes that are sitting vacant um, and we have a limited ability to respond to that. So we have to be very creative about our approaches. Uh, we have to figure out how to use our resources best. Uh, we have to uh, in include everyone. That's why I'm so encouraged to see at this table today, you know, private sector business representative, nonprofit representative and government. You know, that's who we need to bring together to be effective, and we're sitting here talking about it right now. And I'll go to Bill in a second, but roughly how many cases a year do you, do you file? You talked well, about thousands of properties, just so people have a sense of the scale. Well, Mayor Wharton started uh, with filing about 100 lawsuits at once in 2010, and uh, we're now at, uh, we're about to hit the 900 mark in lawsuits filed in environmental court against derelict uh, property owners, owners of, der <laughs> owners of derelict yeah, property. Sure, sure. Okay, about, okay, about 900. Bill. Um, Patrice, as I understand it, uh, you have a, a rough idea of how many parcels of land we're dealing with here. It's about a quarter of a million that are considered blighted in, in some general way. No, right. no, that was the okay. total number of parcels within the city. Of within Memphis. the city, all yes. right. Yes. <laughs> okay. what, but what is the number that, of that that you think are blighted? The well, actually, the Code Enforcement Department receives on an annual basis uh, somewhere around 28,000 service request calls annually related to property codes, uh, properties that okay. um, violate our codes. But, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's structural. Um, we do have property code violations that could uh, be simply parking in the yard or um, something of that nature. Okay, and I want to go back to Bill and mark the fact that in four and a half year, years of doing the show, that is the first <laughs> thing you've said wrong in four and a half years. Well, you've got to improve your record. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, Fans I'm, of the show know this, that every four and a half years is too too often to, to say something inaccurate. I'm, so I'm go going back. to attempt to recover that. Okay, you, you do. Uh, of those quarter of a million parcels, though, you, you are about to have a way to keep better tabs on them with GIS. Yes, yes. Um, that's actually a goal of ours. Um, in regards to an uh, idea of the total number, right now we address annually about 9,500 individual residential parcels that we have to maintain uh, or provide some type of high grass or weed services to. But one of the things that we are looking to do, we've made a request to have AmeriCorp volunteers to come to the city annually to be able to do a citywide survey of the 243,000 parcels that we have to determine the current conditions of those parcels. And there's a GIS app that has been developed um, that a lot of our CDCs are currently using to do that in their uh, limited areas, but we want to expand this across the city. So, Steve, on the ground, what that looks like is you come across something and you dial it in and you say, this is what it looks like right now, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a GIS to, uh, phone app um, process that we're able to go out into our neighborhoods and take pictures live time and make that available to the environmental court, to, to Attorney Barlow, to the trustee's office and, and others. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very good um, start. Of course, it, it should be noted that what we're getting better at is tracking properties. We have a long way to go in figuring out how to stabilize them and maintain them and keep them there. 
Um, I think that we need to think in terms of, of uh, saving our properties in, in terms of maintaining our property tax base rather than inventorying them and figuring out which ones to tear down. That would be a high level, higher level of work. And I think the inventory is going to help us to do that. All right. And, and Mark, from your vantage point on this, what, what he talked about, demolition is really just the beginning because I, I would imagine that a site consultant is not just concerned about a blighted property. He's concerned about an open lot Absolutely. that's where that blighted property used to be. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we've got areas of the city that really have potential to, to really be great locations for businesses, and it's some of the conditions of some of the other parcels around that for example, on Lamar, there are some buildings that were corporate headquarter buildings in the past that are very viable buildings, and the sites are very nice sites, but the condition of the properties around that mm -hmm. is so bad that we can't have anybody that wants to go there to this point. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the trash is a big issue, the blighted properties are a big issue, and one of the things that we've really talked about a lot at the Chamber is focusing on corridors, because we have certain corridors that we use every day, the interstate system and a lot of the roads in and around the airport that we really want to prioritize and focus on first because that's where we go all the time and we think we can change the condition of those areas pretty quickly if we all come together and work at it. Um, Steve, some of the properties that we've been at over the last few years include apartment complexes. Talk for just a second about what, what the challenges are in terms of apartment complexes because I, I've seen some really Byzantine efforts to discover who owns a particular <laughs> house, but an apartment complex is in kind of in a league of its own <laughs> in that regard. Well, that's uh, true to some extent. The uh, the apartment complexes uh, that we have a, we have a lot of older apartment complexes in the core of the city, and uh, the we've had some very negative uh, impact by speculate, speculators and investors who didn't maintain properties. Um, we've had, um, you know, I mean, honestly, historically, we we haven't had the best uh, enforcement tools available to us to make sure that property condition standards were maintained in multifamily residential properties. And uh, there are a lot of aggressive efforts to improve that now, um, but, but we're sort of dealing with the, uh, it, it's a very complex question. Let me give a couple of examples. Uh, the uh, low income housing tax credits. Um, have have a have a very positive impact on a neighborhood of uh, bringing affordable housing to a community where there may be a low uh, uh, low amount of housing available. However, uh, people who have built for low income housing with low income housing tax credits in the past have sometimes built to the horizon of the tax credit. In other words, 15 years. Uh, so they build a 15 year structure, and at the end of 15 years, you have a worthless structure. Uh, and, and there's uh, little incentive to maintain or to continue to be involved uh, financially in, in uh, investing in a property after your tax credits have expired. That's one small example. Uh, there are a lot of other examples of, uh, of ways that these apartments decline. Let's go to an example of, and just, it, 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 was it the Executive Inn? You talked about Lamar, and there was a, a hotel, motel down. It, 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 am I right on that? Mm -hmm. Executive Inn, you were involved with that. It cost a tremendous amount of money to get that finally torn down, and there were trucking companies and others around there that were just so supportive and so frustrated. It took many years. The ownership trail, we had it in the article, and I'm pretty sure that Bill did, you know, the ownership trail going back was multiple owners, LLCs out of Atlanta or out of other places. I mean, there's no, no sense of a, a, a property owner living there just being negligent. This is something, is, it's a morass. And I think it was, was it $600,000 that the city ultimately had to spend to, to essentially buy the property and get it torn down? I mean, there's a huge, hundreds of thousands of dollars that, that went into that, right. that one structure. Right, that's a good example of the story that can be the story of many right. large-scale vacant properties. The story is uh, that it was, an, it was a used, you know, in-service hotel uh, about five or six years ago. Uh, it was, uh, there was a transaction planned uh, from one LLC 
which only owned that asset to another LLC, which is a you know single purpose entity that's formed for the purpose of owning a, a specific piece of property. So one LLC uh, had a deal to sell it to another LLC. Uh, before the deal closed, the roof started leaking. Um, the second LLC and the first LLC had an argument about the finances. The second LLC didn't really want it in the end. Nobody paid the taxes for several years. The water leak got worse. Uh, and now we had an empty hotel with, uh, with a legal dispute, uh, two single purpose entities that were very difficult to chase down because all their, their only asset on their books is that building, which is now right. worth less than the taxes owed. The 600,000 figure that you gave, that's how much in taxes that were owed. And the value of the property, there was a, there was a real investor ready with cash to buy it for $250,000 from one of those shell LLCs. Well, they couldn't buy it for $250,000 because it had $600,000 in taxes. So what we had to do, what the city had to do is get really creative, work with private sector, go to state. We went to the state and got the law changed to allow us to put our demolition lien, which is only about $300,000, in front of the taxes so that now, once the demolition is done and the site is clear, the city can auction off the property for the cost of the right. demolition, and now somebody can do something there. Yeah, I mean, but you think about that. That's one, now maybe one that's property. one particularly large <laughs> property, but the complications yes. of, say, a single family home that got wiped out, the ownership got wiped out in the, in the Great Recession, um, there can be legal complications, maybe not quite that grand, but, but similar. We are running into exactly that scenario, and I'm working nearly every day with Steve on it on houses and this city is full of what we're calling tax dead properties they're little houses in Fraser Whitehaven and any number of other sort of low value neighborhoods where the taxes are 15,000 but the value of the property is 1,000 so it's prohibitive and as you probably know it's against the state constitution to forgive those taxes so we are as we speak we're working on a new tool to allow us to um, work with the city and county to uh, get granted funds to uh, be able, to, for a corporation like mine to be able to go and buy a worthless property and clear the taxes and be able to work on it. Otherwise, they're going to sit there forever or until they get knocked down, right. neither of which is a good solution for the neighborhood. So we encounter, that's certainly more complicated, but there are many thousands of houses yeah. in exactly this situation that, that have at this moment really no clear solution. And from a city point of view, and I, I don't, I, I think I know the answer, but the, so let's say you've just got properties that are blighted and somebody calls and says, I don't care about the legalities, I don't care about the past due taxes, <laughs> right. I just care about the fact that the house across the street is weeds and trash in it and we think there's undesirable people going in and out of the back. What are you going to do? Well, first we actually dispatch a code inspector there to confirm the violation. Once they get there, a violation notice is issued to the owner of that property and we give them a certain amount of time to address it. Of course, if it's a weeds violation or some type of non-structural violation, typically they're given 14 days or less to address it. If they do not address it within that time frame, we will dispatch a vendor to that location to cut the grass, if it's a high grass complaint, and then, of course, place a lien on that property uh, for those services rendered. Um, if it is a structural violation and they do not repair the property within the time that we specified, we will then issue a court summons for them to then appear before Judge Potter, yeah. and or it may be referred to Steve Barlow um, through the MPA process, the Neighborhood Preservation Act. I got you. Right. Is there a point at which you say, well, we're going to tear, we don't, the owner's non-responsive, we tear it down? Or do yes. you have to wait for court approval no, to do No, no. Actually, if the property is considered to be over 51% mm -hmm. dilapidated, uh -huh. it then goes to through a condemnation process, which does require yeah. uh, some legal proceedings to be able to do that, and we then yeah. demolish the property. And again, with, in the face of these issues, what can the business community do? I mean, it's a daunting task for when you talk about the scale of it, you talk about the legal complexities of it and so on. Well, I think what we're focusing on is, is assisting those agencies that are out there already doing it, putting the resources and the influence of the business community behind that. We're going to have three different task force. We're going to have a trash removal task force, a blighted properties task force, and a public education task force because Patrice taught me that <clears throat> that's probably the most important thing is the education part as far as trash is concerned because if you don't teach people not to do that, then when you pick it up, it'll be trashy again in a couple of weeks. So we're not wanting to duplicate what anybody's doing. Just identify those agencies that have the 
wherewithal to make a difference and put resources from the business community behind those entities. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to Bill. Um, Steve, there there is a house that is kind of a test case for you and Frazier that is on University Street, not the University Street in Midtown, but but the University mm -hmm. Street in Frazier. Mm -hmm. um, and of some blighted properties on that particular street, that may be the one that's at the at the top of the list. But you're going in there to to do some renovation work. T tell me about the principle behind. behind well, that. we are. There's actually several on University by this mm -hmm. time, to tell you the truth. But um, it was it was kind of groundbreaking that just several weeks ago, the environmental court granted us this house that has been empty and neglected for years. We went in last Saturday and kind of threw a press conference party. Uh, David Waters uh, covered it in the commercial appeal very well and, and cleaned it up just simply to make a statement. The neighbors came pouring out, uh, shook our hands. Uh, a guy named Wayne from across the street brought out his, his riding mower and, and helped us out. Uh, his wife has, this is, real, this, is, this is what's key about this. His wife gets with me yesterday and says, well, I want to deal with the abandoned house right across the street from there. Um, and, and she didn't want me to do it. She wants me to help her do it. Mm -hmm. um, there are people now working on that street getting houses that I thought I was going to have to do because of the work that we've done. What we're trying to do is, with these sort of statements, is to kickstart the market. Uh, and what we really need to do is expand these tools so it's not just available for nonprofits. We're, we're painfully aware of our, of our limitations. We have to expand some tools so that these blighted and abandoned properties can be tackled by the market and fixed and put back into service. We think there's a market there for these mm -hmm. houses. We know so. When we fix houses, people want to live in them, buy or rent. They want to live there. So um, I tell people, it's 3200 University. Feel, feel free to drive by and have a look right now. There's a five-foot tall mound of garbage in front that the city is going to pick up later this week. And we'll be in there with contractors shortly, and pretty soon it will be the best house on the block. Here's the thing. We take the worst house on the block and fix it up. And our data show that we change the value of the neighborhood $185,000. Yeah, which is tax money. I mean, so people Absolutely. talk about the a deteriorating tax Absolutely. base in the city or in the county. You know, that kind of thing can reverse that trend. That's defending our tax base. So people think it's kind of crazy to put sixty grand into a very dilapidated house, but if they understand the economics, they'll they'll support this kind of reinvestment. Right. It makes better sense than sprawl. It's the only other alternative. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, because if you if you if you take on the worst house on the block, yep. the others were already feasible to some degree. They but. start to fix themselves mm -hmm. in, in the market. And that's really my job in a broken market is to help write the market so that it functions so that, the, again, the other f forms of, of money and energy will come in and fix the neighborhood. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Steve, in, in the years that you've been working on these, on these cases in court, I remember the first batch that we had. Yes, I believe you covered it in uh, your paper. Yeah, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, what, what have you seen over that time? What, what have you learned about this process? And I think the process itself has changed as a result of the city pursuing these cases. Definitely has. Uh, one of the, uh, before I get into detail on that, I'd like to just comment, the, the 3200 University was one of about 19 properties that Fraser CDC asked the city to pursue. The city then, through Patrice's department, wrote the houses up and submitted them for court uh, action. Uh, so there was this great partnership between uh, private uh, you know, from a nonprofit and the city, uh, and a focus. Uh, what uh, what Mark talked about is the corridor focus. Uh, there's also sort of a need for a neighborhood focus. What we have to realize is this challenge is so huge that if we're going to be strategic, we've got to focus on an area. So that's a direction I'd like to take it. Uh, in terms of the, where we've come from, where we started, uh, when we first began, um, there were some uh, technical legal changes that needed to be made. We've been back with the help of the chamber uh, twice to Nashville to get amendments to the state law that allows us to bring these actions to make it very clear uh, exactly what remedies are available. And th those, the, your reception in Nashville uh, in, in the legislature. Hundred percent support yeah. every time. Because they, these are issues in na in cities and and in rural areas too, I assume. Yes, that's right. And the uh, the law that we that we uh, are using is called the Neighborhood Preservation Act. 
and uh, it's currently only applicable in uh, the big cities, uh, but uh, this year, last year, another city was added, and this year, another city is being added. So, so cities across the state are, are realizing the benefits. Uh, wh one of the things that's changed is the, I mean, the, the courtroom. Uh, you know, this we brought the first case, and there was there was no precedent, and so now there is very clear uh, the clear process established in the court, and we also have. Uh, law students from the University of Memphis who are now participating as litigators in the courtroom. So it's really growing. Yeah, it, we have just a minute left. I'm going to ask Steve if you could change, you know, a state law or two to help do to attack this. What would it be? Well, I don't. This isn't state, but right this sure. minute, yeah. we we need approval of the anti blight grant program from the city and county now that it's been cleared by the attorney general. Uh, to allow us to to yeah. attack these tax, uh, these uh, upside down blighted properties, the tax dead properties. It, it, Mark, one thing. I mean, again, thirty seconds left here that you'd like to see changed. It's just from a, a governmental kind of. If you wave a magic wand, what would it be? Well, I think that they're working on the process to make it quicker to get these blighted properties back yeah. into service. Just speeding up the process would would really help. I think it takes a long time. Right, and Steve, a change you'd make? Ten seconds. Uh, fix tax foreclosure process, remove the tax sale auctions and make it a streamlined process. And the, the, there is a law that the here, trustee here. and others have been pushing through that to yes. streamline that process. I working on and it. It's, and working on it. Okay. Thank you all for being here. Patrice, Steve, Steve, Thank Mark, you. and of course, Bill. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. Good night. Funding for Behind the Headlines is provided by DHG and Advisors. DHG is a full-service accounting firm serving Memphis and the Mid-South region for more than 60 years, combining community involvement with the technical resources of a national firm. For more information, visit dhgllp.com.